Hello, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Daily French Show. I'm your host, Nicholas Lorimer. And um, for those watching live, we have actually started at the time that we've been trying to start at for, well, since I think we've pretty much started on YouTube, which is uh, 1.30. So anyway, I'm very happy that we've managed to pull that off. But uh, anyway, on the panel today with me is uh, the the great and wise Saragon. Hi, Nick. Still great, still wise. And uh, the uh, wise and great Terence Corrigan. Terence, how are you? I used to be very venerable. It seems that I've been reassigned. <laughs> I like to no, change it up. You know, venerable, venerable. You know, if we're going to, if we're going to constantly pat each other on the back as people have accused us of doing, I want to make it at least a bit grandiose. So oh. might as well. Um, anyway, it is another wonderful week. Oh, sorry, my dogs are barking. It is another wonderful week in uh, South Africa. And of course, even a quiet week in South African news is an exciting week in South African news because something wild and wacky happens. And I think the best example of that is what happened this weekend, which was our Minister of Defense got taken hostage. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, Minister of Defense... Um, uh, Tony Bodisa and and uh, and uh, the minister in the presidency, whose name I've forgotten. Oh, Mondile Gumbela, um, were meeting with uh, Mkonto Sizwe military veterans who had some demands. Apparently, among these demands are um, better care and payment of reparations. Um, they had previously forced their way into Latuli House. They also demanded to speak with David Mabuza and Cyril Ramaphosa, but they were not granted uh, permission to do this, or, or Cyril didn't agree to it. He instead sent the defense minister. Um, they also apparently want government to give them each 4 million rand for their role in liberating South Africa. Anyway, um, with such reasonable demands, the defense minister decided that she needed to leave the meeting, and so she attempted to leave. And uh, they blocked the hall and they would not let her out. In fact, they appear to have taken her hostage. Um, there were videos circulating on social media showing that they had essentially blocked the doors. And while they insist that, no, 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 they were just demanding accountability and that no one was taken hostage, I believe a special task force of police had to be sent in to extract the two ministers from the situation. So we're going to be talking about three stories today. The first two are about the collapse of state power and the last one is about the massive overextension of state power but anyway let's let's talk about this one um i'll start with you sarah what do you make of this uh this is just crazy <laughs> don't you think uh, it you know what it what it is more than anything is it's a part of the why it's a, it reflects the wider collapse of 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 anc rule and anc governance because it's got groups of people who have no status but no particular status to to have a meeting with a minister so why she had a meeting with him god only knows in any capacity other than as an anc person um it, uh, the umkonto west veterans association has been disbanded and i'm sure it had lots to do with with um carl niehaus um but but the point is you know, they were, I gather there were 56 people arrested because of this hostage taking. Right, uh, and they I have now been that... charged. They were in court, I think, today. Okay, I, I'm curious to know, because I didn't see any of the footage, how many of those 56 um, are under the age of 60? Because there is pretty much no chance that anyone under the age of 60 is a veteran. So, and 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 the Nkota is where Veterans Association had this, let's call it a private army of seemingly trained young men, I mean, it, it was a disgrace. I mean, there, sh there should have been uh, there should have been legal action taken against the, the organization for creating this little militia. And I think what's happened is the, basically there are no jobs. The government has failed in almost every respect. And suddenly you've got these people who, who many of whom were probably never outside of the struggle and the context of the struggle going to get long-term decent employment. So they are literally and figuratively cash-strapped. Cash um, and, I, and I, I think 
I, I, I'm sure there's a, there are a whole lot of emotional um, reasons for ending up in a meeting of this nature, but you know, they, they, as a group, they have no authority, and, and they had no particular authority to demand a meeting from 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 the minister. Why shouldn't we all be able to demand a hastily uh, got together meeting from the minister to put forward some or other grievance? Um, and you know, at the end of the day, you know, their role in the struggle. It's uh, it is historic. It it's 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 it benefited to the extent that it benefited the ANC. Um, it's it's the ANC's supposedly the ANC's veterans, and essentially they're they're probably desperate financially and economically desperate, and uh, by banding to by banding together as representative of of uh, of veterans, they they got a hearing. And uh, there was nothing the minister could do. We had, that she, they can't use our money to pay these guys, and we they have no money of ours to give anymore. So it ended up nasty. So, I, I agree with your assessment that they are that they are you know uh, these guys often have a difficult time. I think military veterans do get some kind of social security uh, payment of some type, but it's not a lot. Yeah. What really does make me lose sympathy with these guys is that <laughs> this alleged de- the, the, that they were allegedly demanding four million rand each <laughs> for their role in liberating South Africa. That seems to be the actually really... will become a, a, a controversy. We're veteran, <laughs> indeed. Um, uh, David Mabuza was asked about this, and he just urged members of the military veterans to be patient, saying their plight will be addressed. Um, and then he said that the ANC is working tirelessly around the clock to improve the living conditions of ex-soldiers. Terence, what do you make of this story? Well, look, I think there's a few things going on here. Um, the first is that it says something about South Africa's history. Um, and this is that even within the ANC's own frame of reference, MK was more on propaganda than a serious threat to the state. I mean, if you compare it to uh, Renault, uh, to to uh, uh, Frelimo, to the MPLA, to uh, Zanu and Zapu in... in um, in, in Zimbabwe. I mean, those were uh, military forces to be reckoned with. Uh, and not just not just the regulars that have, you know, they were they were essentially trained trained armies. Now, you know, one can argue what one, one can argue about the about the ideology and you know to what extent was it the weaknesses of the Portuguese Empire versus the military prowess of um, uh, of the of of uh, FAPLA or whatever. But the point is that you had um, a military conflict there that was, in a sense, decisive. MK, outside of uh, political imagination, was probably one of the least effective uh, armed resistance movements in the 20th century. Um, and this was a very, very, this this was something that the ANC would acknowledge. I remember there was a, an interview in about 1991 with Jeremy Cronin where he said, you know, obviously... The seizure, the seizure of power was never was 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 always a distant prospect, given the SADF's uh, uh, strength and its indigenous character. And I mean that was that was pretty standard. When I was at university, you saw this starting to starting to change. A lecturer of mine who had a black consciousness background um, very dismissively said, "Well, you know, MK never liberated a square a square inch of the country," and he took a great deal of a great deal of flack for this. And he, his response was, well, you know, to convince me I'm wrong, and no one could really give him any evidence. The other thing is that I think that there are various components to this kind of, um, let's say, MK circle. Um, and this, this, was a, this was an issue that um, was highlighted around 1993, 94, 95, but then uh, receded into the background, that there were multiple parts of what was sort of loosely called MK. They, they were the properly trained, you know, guys who had been uh, schooled in Tanzania or in the Soviet Union or whatever, who had a sort of conventional training. And I remember that the, I think it was the British military mission that was helping with the, with the integration said that, that that wasn't really, um, those guys had a, had a certain military professionalism and they could be integrated. The problem was that there were also loads and loads of people coming in claiming to be members of MK who had been part of self-defense units you know, been given a bit of a bit of firearms training um, and some and, and some political lectures, but hadn't really been part of a military structure. And this then was the um, was the problem. They didn't have a military background. They weren't suited for it. And it was surplus to the to, to, to the requirements of what the country needed anyway. 
but you know they could claim a certain involvement um you know i understand that our most famous um, mk veteran Carl Niehaus, also fits into something akin to this category as i don't believe he ever received any formal military training um he was involved in a sabotage plot and then kind of fixed himself on after the fact although maybe i'm uh, maybe well, i'm wrong he, he, i i think he got caught though he never actually carried out the sabotage no 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 no, no but you know it was you know it, it wasn't like he had gone and learned, learned military drill and was infiltrated back to uh you know to do uh to do things that would be sort of expected of a um of a of a of a trained soldier uh this was the kind of do it yourself i am by by my own identification and sort of my my acceptance now that becomes a very very elastic group of people um I don't as far as I'm aware there were no there were no lists kept of um of of MK veterans from those you know uh, ad hoc township units uh while um they were from you know the 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 guys who received to receive proper formal military training so you know exactly what that sort of commitment amounts to is uh well who knows um this has not just been a South African issue. I know in in Ireland, in the in, in the late nineteen twenties, there was a there were certain welfare payments you could get if you had if you had fought, fought fought in the Irish Civil War or the Irish War of Independence. There was a lot of bitterness about the records being kept um, imperfectly, and uh, you know someone someone claimed to have been a veteran of the Connemara campaign or whatever, but you know no one could um, uh, no one could find a uh, uh, find a record of this. Um, yeah. I, but I think that that um, you take you take that background where I think there can be legitimate uh, grievances, and you add it to a uh, to the general lousy socioeconomic conditions where people are going to try and pass whatever they can, um, and you add to it the general uh, farce that has uh, that has become governance in South Africa, and you end up with this kind of hostage taking light. Where we are, we didn't really threaten anyone. We just locked the doors. Um, you know, it's, I, I, I'm not sure whether this is a serious threat to security or a sort of late middle age prank. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it just it just goes to underline that South Africa is increasingly not a serious country anymore. And it's and it's and and this is not something to giggle at because you know, guys who had some some firearms training, you know, can be antsy. Yeah, I mean, we've seen, we've seen what the the lack of capacity in the state does. Um, we saw it during the riots in July, right? Yeah. Uh, with the, <laughs> the country basically, but uh, law and order collapsed for about a week or more. Um, yeah. And, uh, our our CEO and and uh, incoming CEO and former and current CEO went down to uh, have a look at stuff in Natal over the with the the week. The, the, the previous week and uh, they say that yeah the <laughs> the riots really show uh, that the state has retreated in a lot of places um well you know i went down to i went down to cases myself two weeks ago and uh, the thing that i that uh, i think stuck with me as much as anything was going through standerton um you know you talk about 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 the state having retreated i used to do that route regularly when my parents were alive and standerton was always this kind of like golf but functional rural town yeah, and I'm, you know, that that's that, that's fine. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not talking down to it. It's, there's a, there's a certain, you know, backwards charm to it. Well, you know, this is. Uh, I'm reminded of the words of P.J. O'Rourke that you know what, uh, that the road hazard is what is, this, is is what passes for the road. Um, I thought you know we we complain about Johannesburg and believe me, there's enough to complain about. Yeah, but this was just, you know, beyond any. Uh, this is just sort of an ungoverned space. In fact, uh, uh, the, the Lekwe municipality is under administration and the administrator, who is apparently has a long history of doing administrations and uh, a city management, said the full horror of what, uh, of what awaited him. He didn't, he, he didn't appreciate it and he lives in the town. He said he opened the books and it was just, what's happened? It's kind of, well, this is, this is sort of what happens when uh, governance is not the primary concern of government. Indeed. Sarah, any final thoughts before we move on? No, just to say, I've done a, a fair amount of traveling recently um, in the hinterland. And 
I mean, one doesn't, as an outsider, tend to know about things like water and electricity problems, but the state of the this is the streets, the roads, the, the middles of the town, the litter, the government, I, I think someone said in an article this weekend, has, has actually disappeared. It's, it's, it, it doesn't want to be, be the government anymore. It'd rather someone else get voted in to do this work. We'd rather vote someone else in to do this work. <laughs> All right, let us move on to our next story for today. And that is, Terence, uh, last week on Monday, you uh, talked to us about Glencoe um, and mm. the shooting that had happened there. Uh, you've been following the case very clear, closely to make sure that it is not spun by those with um, uh, by the toxic spinners. agendas. Yes, by the spinners out there, um, as so many of these cases often are. What's the latest? Yeah, well... Um... There was the second round of the, of, of the bail hearing uh, last week. Unfortunately, I couldn't attend it personally, but uh, our inestimable colleague Caden Lang was back uh, was back there and um, said, um, I'm, I'm, "I'm very happy to say that people on both sides of the aisle, as it were, um, uh, recognised him and were eager to talk." Um, basically, what happens is that um, is that what what I described last week um, about the um, uh, defense's reliance on, for instance, the uh, video footage, the prosecution's, the investigating officer's reluctance to recognize that, and the um, whole question of uh, Mr. Simpson having gone and fetched a firearm and um, come back to confront the people who were trying to um, uh, trying to remove the cows from his property. That essentially has um, ha has continued as we as as we expected it would. Um, the, the, the investigating officer seems to intimate that he doesn't believe that the footage is genuine, although he doesn't seem to be offering very much evidence as to, um, as to what would, um, uh, what would have, um, been done to it. There's, there's a, there's a kind of in, insinuation that, um, it's been doctored, although, um, you know, I'm not a, I'm not an IT tech guru, but, it just seems to be that if uh, sounds or images were being inserted, you would see you would see something in the footage that has been um, that has been uh, uh, released. Um, he also claimed he was also asked by the defense, well, why would why would he uh, why would Simpson have asked his son to film it? And his response was, well, you know, he wanted it seemed to be that he wanted um, a record of himself killing someone, which would seem to be completely counter. You know, uh, counter <laughs> yeah, no, but, that's not. Um, that that being said, um, there does seem to be some uh, some sympathy on the part of the magistrate, um, and this is, as I say, this is this is not a legal evaluation. It's just uh, um, it, it's just our observations that uh, you know as to why Simpson separated himself, went back to the uh, went back to the house, and then returned um, instead of simply um, uh, sort of locking himself in, if he feared that there would be um, that 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 there was going to be a, that there was going to be a confrontation. Um, and, you know, I think that, uh, yeah, this is, this is really, well, at the moment, we're just talking, we're just talking bail. Um, I think that Mr. Simpson's now been in prison for, uh, three, uh, getting on to four weeks, um, maybe a bit shorter. Um, and we're going to find out later in the week if that, if that bail is granted. Now that's just the bail. We know we then, we then head on to the trial and we intend to be there for the, um, uh, for the, for the whole thing. You know, as I as I said last week, there are a lot of issues that that um, uh, that interact with each other here. There's the question of uh, of grazing, uh, pasturage, uh, biosecurity. Um, those of us whose interaction with the agricultural value chain is limited to the uh, to the freezer at, at at Shoprite don't appreciate just you know how destructive it can be. For let's say an unvaccinated cow to move into a, um, a uh, into a commercial herd um, uh, carrying uh, uh, carrying disease, um, and that is a uh, that is a major problem for both established and emerging commercial um, uh, commercial farmers of all of all backgrounds. Uh, the question of stock theft, and this also features in this um, uh, in the story, since some of the cows appear to have the brand of a um, of a former neighbour of Mr. Simpson. Um, you know, I was I, I was speaking to, to 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 another of our colleagues, um, whose family um, uh, whose family also has some farming interests, and he was saying 
that a cow, you know, costs upwards of 8,000 Rand and upwards. Now, um, just, the, just think to lose one cow to theft, that's what a lot of uh, middle class families living in, living in the suburbs of Joburg struggle to pay in their bond, bond repayments every month. You know, this isn't, this isn't a small sum of money. Um, and, um, you know, there, there, is these, there is the basic breakdown, once again, the state capacity issue, the basic breakdown of, uh, um, of management of, um, of land and uh, livestock disputes. Um, so you have a situation where cattle um, is found on a um, on a farmer's property. He then impounds it, and he often has to hold it for a number of days. Um, it is then pass, um, it can then be passed on to a to to a stock theft unit to to be impounded in a municipal pound. But by that stage, there's often been claims on the claims on the animals. And uh, it's just a situation primed for conflict, and stock theft is just not given much uh, much attention by 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 by, by many police um, police stations. And even if they do, it's something that requires a lot of you know particular equipment. I mean, if you're going to go pick up you know ten stolen cows, you need a particularly large truck. Those right. often those often are just not available. If you want to right. go and uh, chase rustlers into the mountains leading into Lesotho, you need helicopters, quad bikes, horses, all that sort of thing often not available right I, I mean it's it's really bad on the police my uh, I have a friend who recently laid some charges at a police station and there was a policeman assigned and the policeman was pretty you know trying his best to help but he didn't have data to get the video evidence of the crime on his mm. phone and you think if you can't afford to give your cops some like data to download oh so the email didn't work for the police station either uh, how are you ever going to do something like pick up cattle <laughs> that have been stolen? Well, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, look, just, just um, you know, on a, on a much smaller scale. A couple of years ago, um, uh, I had a I had a tire stolen from my car, and I went to report it, and the police officers just seemed to think this was this was a huge joke. Um, and I leaned across and I said to him. You know, you take. You know, you say to us, you know, communities must come together, cooperate. Well, here I am. You know, this 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 probably doesn't sound like very much to you, but you know, my um uh, my my property was 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 stolen. I've got, in fact, I know who did it. You know, he has a photograph. Um, and my wife had a um uh, had a had a handbag uh, snatched from her car once. We we went to report it. The police lady, who was I must say very pleasant and efficient, and efficient, said, "Do you want an investigation, or is this just for insurance?" Um, as it turns out, a couple of weeks later, there was a there was a report in the local paper about a riverbed right near to where the the um, the theft had taken place. So they found like some fifty handbags. Obviously, this was some sort of a, a repeat thing. People just were taking what they needed and just throwing throwing the bags there. But it just proved that nobody had actually even gone to uh, gone to check out the scene. Sarah, uh, we haven't gotten your thoughts on the Glencoe thing. Just briefly, well, how, uh, what do you make of this story? Anything to add to what Terence has said? Well, I, I think what it obliquely also gives put, sheds a light on is the fact that you know you you, you have this sort of talk about uh, improving the skills of subsistence farmers and uh, making sure that they have uh, you know a certain amount of land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But let's be honest, farming is an is, is a complex um, business. It's it's the the equipment is expensive. It it takes it uses a lot of technology to be successful commercial farming. A lot of hard work and slog, and you, you know all you, all the government's doing by sort of encourage somehow encouraging that land redistribution should be distribution for the purposes of farming is pie in the sky stuff because so, um, this sort of farming is not going to contribute to to food security in the country. Farming is not what it was 100 years ago or 50 years ago. It's a, it's a very complex, sophisticated um, right. process. And I'm not sure if the government entirely understands the, 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 what, what, the, what farming is in, what farming is and needs to be and can be, and whether people should be encouraged to be given land to farm when they, if, if they're lucky, they'll keep themselves alive. Uh, as opposed to being nearer to a, a town or a city where they should have been subject to government policy, work for people to take up. 
So I think there's a, there's a tendency to live in some sort of nether world of 100 years back that doesn't really make any sense in a modern economy. And if it's if it, if if they not don't get to grip, grips with it, they're going to they're going to play a role in destroying it. Or perhaps one might cynically say that lots of subsistence farmers are much easier to control uh, than a wealthy, educated, urban middle class. Anyway, uh, let us move now from talking about state collapse to talking about the massive state expansion. And of course, we are talking about the People's Republic of China. So if you are a Muslim um, or, or a religious person in general, you might want to read your religious text uh, on on an app, maybe. Maybe it's, uh, you know, you don't have access to the book at a time. Maybe you want to read a daily passage, something like that. So you download a thing onto your phone, and so you can read your religious text. Well, the most popular version of the Quran, which is an app called Quran Majid, um, it is also the most popular Quran app in the world with 35 million users and 150,000 reviews, uh, has been taken down in China, banned. According to a BBC report, it was removed for, quote, hosting illegal religious texts. The Chinese government did not respond to any uh, requests for comment on this. And when Apple was asked why they had taken an app which does nothing more than show the Islamic holy book down from their app store, they said... Look, um, we we have a human rights policy and we're required to comply with local laws. And at times there are complex issues about which we may disagree with governments. The operators of the app, a company called PDMS, uh, has said that their app was removed without telling them why. And that they are trying to get in touch with the Chinese Cyberspace Administration and relevant Chinese authorities to get the issue uh, resolved. Uh, however, there's no clear law that they seem to have broken. Even in China, there is no law that bans, for example, Islam. Uh, Islam is actually recognized by the Chinese government, at least officially, as you know, a religion with some sort of legal standing. So I guess the larger question this raises is, once again, this seems to be another example of large corporations based mostly in the West succumbing to Chinese pressure to do things that are completely unacceptable to a framework uh, of a free society. Sara, what do you make of this? I think that's exactly it. I think the Chinese government says we're taking this down and Apple says, oh, okay, oh, okay. Um, you know, it's going to very, do a very quick mathematical analysis of where its fortunes lie with in Apple in China in general. And, uh, you know, much as the... the uh, the uh, IT world in the West is imbued with wokeism and social justice. Um, I would imagine that. Well, it that seems very selective, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it seems very selective. It's. Um, I, I was struck by this recently that uh, uh, Disney said they would no longer film in Georgia due to Georgia's uh, abortion restrictions, but I'm pretty sure that Disney, firstly. Uh, films in China, which <laughs> has possibly been committing a genocide in uh, Xinjiang. And it also is perfectly happy to work with governments in other countries that completely have banned abort abortion. So it kind of really suggests that a lot of this is completely false, uh, fake, sanctimonious garbage. Well, well let, let's put it this way. I mean, I think the, the, the example that makes me smile every time is the one of the ice cream makers, Ben and Jerry, who uh, won't have their ice cream sold in the in in um, the West Bank because it's being sold on occupied Palestinian land now it's the land is is actually disputed and then the, therefore it is disputed and all I can think of is well it's it, if Apple in China is a little different to ice cream in Israel because you can, I can tell you ice cream made in Israel is very nice. So the Israelis will plug that gap very, very quickly. And all that makes it do is, is it makes the, the guys who who run the companies, who own the companies, who founded the companies, look like weak need. Let's put it this way. The, 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 the principled line doesn't wash for very long. If, 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 if in, as far as Apple's concerned, it washed for very long at all. Um, so I'm sure it was just a business decision was – you know, 
look, guys, the government, Xi Jinping has said we take down the site, we take down the site. I mean, they're not going to risk the sale of Apple goods in in China. So, Terence, I've, I've managed time badly here, but in 30 seconds or so, your thoughts on this issue. Two, uh, two things. First of all, um, uh, the Communist Party of China a couple of years ago said that they were going to be sinicizing their education. They were removing parts of school of, of school texts and certain books from the library. One of the things they wanted, they, they, they were going to be editing religious texts to give them a sort of Communist Party of Chinese, um, uh, a China approved um, uh, approved slant. This, include, this includes the Bible. Now, interestingly, um, China, when it was opening up in the in the nineties, was not averse to uh, to Christianity coming in, but it kind of had to be a very uh, esoteric, otherworldly type of type of religion. It's about managing your spiritual life. Don't mess with Caesar. So the Catholic Church, you know, which you know is a is a worldwide organization, is effect was effectively a banned organ, banned organization. And uh, the current Pope and I, and I'm a Catholic myself. Uh, sold out the Christians of China for um, uh, for and and in with people who hate him. The other thing is that China does this sort of thing all the time. There's no clear rules. Um, Hollywood has learned to play this game very well. You will not get a movie like Red Corner being made anymore. And it's not because you know there's a the necessarily there's a guy in the, in the Chinese censor board who says no take out this line and take out that line. It's just a sort of sense that. Uh, this isn't this isn't going to play well, so we just don't go there anymore. Um, yes. So you yes. know, I think I that's think a far more effective tool. The Chinese have managed to do something that I think many authoritarian nations around the world would salivate at. They get free societies to do their dirty work for them. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. So thank you very much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you tomorrow on the Daily Friend Show. We hope you have a great one, everyone. Cheers.